Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here's our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame, where we offer you true stories about real people. Just three days ago in Oslo, Norway, the Nobel Foundation awarded their annual peace prizes. This was done according to the terms of the will of the late Alfred Bernard Nobel. Tonight we tell you the little-known story behind that will. And later in the broadcast, you'll hear a recorded report from Oslo with the dramatic highlight of the Nobel Award. Now, here is Frank Goss for the makers of Hallmark Cards. Want to delight your friends during the new year by remembering their birthdays and wedding anniversaries? It's easy if you get your Hallmark date book for 1954. You'll find this page-by-page -page calendar booklet has plenty of space for jotting down important dates and names and addresses, too. What's more, the Hallmark date book is a gift to you from the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. The cards you send when you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Cole Porter musical Kiss Me Kate, starring Catherine Grayson, Howard Keel, and Ann Miller. And now Mr. Barrymore brings you the story of Alfred Nobel on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Alfred Nobel was an inventive genius. He might also be called a business magnet, a writer, a poet, a thinker. Whatever label the history shall finally give to this strange and solitary man, one fact is apparent. His life and his actions have made an indelible and shaping imprint on the life and actions of every man since his time. Our story begins in Helenborg, Sweden, 1864. I am Constable Brun. I'm investigating the explosion. Sit there. Your full name? Alfred Bernhard Nobel. Age? 31. Your work? I'm a civil engineer. I worked with my father at the factory. I'm well aware of that, Mr. Nobel. Now tell me, how did the explosion occur? I don't know. I've been trying to think. Then perhaps you can tell me who was responsible. Well, I applied for the license. I hold the patent. It's my business. Ah. Then you're responsible, Mr. Nobel. I intend to make that fact public at an official inquiry. May I go now, Constable? Uh, just one thing more, Mr. Nobel. Come. Identify him. I've never seen him. Possibly just a passerby. Ah. Another passerby? No. Who is he? Who is he? Emil Nobel. What? My youngest brother. Ah. Uh, uh, thank you. you. You may go now, Mr. Nobel. October 4, 1867. Dear Mother, Nitroglycerin, as we used it in liquid form, is unmanageable. And that was the reason for our personal disaster. I have recently succeeded in combining it with an absorbent. The new product 
is entirely safe. We intend to manufacture it through companies in all parts of the world. We call it dynamite. May I come in? Mother! Well, this is a nice surprise. How are you, my son? Oh, forgive me, Mother. Oh, headaches again? Yes, constantly. For a week now. Pierre tells me you've spent every waking hour in the laboratory or in a business meeting. You're getting to be a very rich man at the price of these headaches. <laughs> the doctors tell me nitroglycerin causes it. A mansion in Paris, another one in Italy, one in England, horses, carriages, paintings, wardrobes, all that money can buy. Do you have to work? Ah, uh, Mother, you don't understand. I've seen how you live in the few weeks you've been home organizing the new factory. Do you ever go out with your friends? Friends? What friends? Where are they? Who are they? Everywhere I turn, they come to me with schemes, ambitions. I have no schemes. No, no, no. I, I know, Mother. And you're the only one I trust. That's a very nice thing to say to a mother. But I'll try very, very hard to forget you even said it. Hmm? Alfred, I can love you and be devoted to you. But you need warmth and affection from someone else. Well, perhaps... Uh, I'll be leaving soon. The Prussians and, and the French have come to terms. I'll be working in Paris again. Oh, Alfred. No matter where you go, it'll be the same. What? I'm afraid you're the loneliest millionaire on Earth. I beg your pardon. Oui, monsieur. I, I would like to put an advertisement in your paper. Oui. Answerable in care of the editorial office. Uh, yes, well, um, here it is. Uh, this is for yourself, monsieur? Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's right. And uh, just as it is written? Yes, yes. It will appear tomorrow then, monsieur. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Oui. Uh, good day. Good day. Elderly, cultured gentleman, very wealthy, speaks five languages, resident of Paris, seeks equally mature lady as secretary and supervisor of household. Oh, monsieur. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. At Christmas time, all of us love to do something special for our favorite little folks, for nieces or nephews, the children of our friends, and the youngsters who live next door. One of the surest ways to make a hit with the boys and girls you know is to send each of them a Hallmark Magic Money Tree or a Hallmark Money Train. These are the Hallmark cards specially designed to hold 10 shiny new dimes. Not only are they fun to receive, but the children will be pleased as punch to have money of their own to buy anything their hearts desire. You'll find Hallmark Magic Money Trees, or trains, are the perfect answer to that old question, what shall I send Susie this year? Or Mike, or Jimmy, or Jane, and they cost just 25 cents each. Also at the fine store where you buy them, you'll find Hallmark Money Enclosures for grown-ups, too, in many attractive styles. So why not choose yours tomorrow? Remember that Hallmark is right on the back, the famous Hallmark that says... You care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Alfred Nobel. During his lifetime, Alfred Nobel was known as the Dynamite King. 
The day he placed the advertisement for a secretary, he destined himself to become known as the man of peace. There was just a single response to his advertisement. Dear sir, I would be pleased if you would consider the qualifications which I have enumerated below. I am 33 years of age, unmarried, and have been employed until recently as governess in the home of Baron von Suttner. I speak five languages besides German, English, French, Spanish, Italian... Countess Kinski. Why, yes. You are Mr. Novell? How do you do? I, uh, I took rooms for you at the Grand. That was very thoughtful. Something wrong? You're much younger than you say. No, Mr. Novell. But I'll admit I am started. I was expecting an elderly man. You can't be over 40. Yeah. Well, I am. Something is wrong now? No. It's just that I didn't expect you to measure up to your letters. Well, you are a very frank person, Mr. Novell. I won't ask you what you have decided now that you have seen me. I've decided that your letters are not worthy of you. Welcome to Paris, Bertha Kinski. Good evening, Pierre. Will you tell Mr. Nobel I'm waiting for him? Oh, he is not here, monsieur. He has been away every evening this week. He is completely contemptuous of work. You met the Comtesse? Uh, briefly. Aha. She is going to work for him, isn't she? As soon as her quarters in the main building are arranged. Uh, I believe Mademoiselle is here to stay. <laughs> Stop, please. Stop here, driver. This is the Louvre? Yes. That burned out shell that was once so splendid. The Prussian gunners must have been very accurate during the war. Bertha, you're trembling. I really shouldn't be. After all, I was an officer's daughter. Wars have always been nothing more than periodic visitations. Such as... Earthquakes and floods. Mm, there will always be wars. I wish there were a way to stop them. There is, Alfred. Oh, there is. You are a rich and powerful man. Suppose you were to use your wealth and power to stop wars. Yes, I've thought of it. All I have to do is to work very hard and invent something so terrible that any participants would be in danger of complete annihilation. Stop it! Yes, sir. Is that why you invented dynamite? For war? For everything but war. For rivers to be drenched. Mines to be opened, harbors and buildings, and all of the things that would be impossible without it. Bertha, you know that is honestly the fact. When I first met you at the station, I was truly surprised that the Dynamite King could have such blue eyes and a kindly face. But you are a cynic, Alfred. You are afraid to face facts. Facts? I face the facts in my laboratory. Driver, move on. Alfred? Bertha, I, I'm leaving for Stockholm in an hour. Oh? I came by to apologize before I left. I have thought a great deal about what we, we were discussing earlier. All my life I've thought of it. And all my life I have thought of someone like you. Oh. In our few days together, I've discovered a great deal. Have you, Alfred? Don't you understand? Wait. That... I must tell you. There is someone else. The son of the family I worked for in Vienna. Otto von Suttner. His family objected. It is all over now. Thank you for telling me. I shan't be away too long. A little time will pass. 
You will have a new life here, and you'll forget. Welcome back, monsieur. How is she? How is her apartment? Is she comfortable? Uh, Monsieur Nobel, if you will let me take your coat. Yes, 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 here. Uh, is she in her apartment now? Mademoiselle is not here. The... What? She is not here, monsieur. She left two days ago. This is for you. Forgive me, Alfred. I could not forget him. I am now... Baroness von Suttner, in spite of the family objections, wish us luck. I have told my husband about you, and both now feel you are our most precious friend. Yes, Alfred Nobel had found love and lost it. Once again, he was a lonely man in the world of strangers. And the years went by. We must see no about this. We must see no. Uh, gentlemen, it is impossible to talk to him. He is not here. What? Not here. Monsieur Nobel left two days ago for Zurich. Zurich? Is he going to address the Peace Congress? I cannot answer that. I know Baroness von Sutter is there. Did he go to see her? I suspect he did go to see her. Ah, well, uh, von Sutter, the woman who wrote the book, Lay Down Arms? Yes. When will he return? What will we do? Yes, I yes. suggest you wait until you hear from Monsieur Nobel. Here, I wanted to see you address a peace congress. I wanted to hear what you had to say. Is that all? No. More than that, the memory of a conversation we had one night on the Champs-Élysées. I'd like to finish it. I remember telling you that my plan to end wars was to make them so frightful that no nation would dare enter into one. Yes, I remember. Mm, quite different from the disarmament and congress of nations that you proposed in your book. I believe what I wrote. Ah, my dear, I'm convinced of that. Your book caused me to ask myself many questions about peace. Do you think that nations, large and small, weak and strong, could find a solution? All the nations? Yes, provided they were armed with another weapon. Knowledge. That is our greatest hope for the future. To spread knowledge is to spread well-being. Knowledge is the real weapon. And someday, I will help the world to recognize it. Oh, Alfred. <laughs> so, at last, we finish our conversation on the Champs-Élysées. That was the last time Baroness von Suttner saw Alfred Nobel alive. A few months later, he died in his laboratory in San Remo, Italy. Pierre, well, what are you doing in Vienna? I have come to see you, madame. You have heard of Monsieur Nobel's death? Yes, I know. I brought you a copy of this. What is it? His will, madame. I thought you would want to see it. Goodbye, madame. The capital shall constitute a fund, annual interest on which shall be awarded as prizes to those persons who during the previous year have rendered the greatest services to mankind. <sighs> to the person who has made the most important contribution 
in the realm of physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and one part to the person who has done the most or best work for the Brotherhood of Nations, the abolition or reduction of standing armies, as well as for the formalization of peace congresses. an indomitable hope of the future. The most magnificent gesture that a private individual has ever had the desire or ability to make. The prize winners have included such men and women as Marconi, Madame Curie, Eugene O'Neill, Dr. Ralph Bunch, and Winston Churchill. People from all lands who have done a service for all mankind. Indeed, an inspiration in a fretful world. And the latest distinguished American name to be added to this truly distinguished list is that of General George C. Marshall, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize for 1953. Ladies and gentlemen, the Hallmark Hall of Fame takes you now to Oslo, Norway. This is Carl Rick, uh, Norwegian Broadcasting, Oslo calling CBS on the um, Nobel Peace Prize Award today awarding speech and General Marshall acceptance speech. Interrupted by demonstrations of the communists in the gallery. Yeah. Dear Mr. Marshall, it's with deep feeling of sympathy and gratitude that we are here today. We meet you, a man whose whole career was that of a soldier. But when you had the position in your government, you proposed and went in for the most constructive, peaceful work we have seen in this century. You saw that there is no foundation for peace when there is economic chaos and misery amongst people. With these words, I have the honor. I have the great honor to go over to you the insignia of the Nobel Peace Prize, the diplomat, and the gold medal. honor with profound gratitude that has been conferred upon me by the Nobel Committee, and I do it not merely for myself, more especially for the American people who alone made possible the authority and possible the funds which made the European recovery program a reality. Thank you very much. What could be a more moving tribute to the memory of Albert Nobel? And now here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. If you'd like to delight your friends this Christmas with a card that's really a gift and decoration too, here's a bright idea. Choose new Hallmark Christmas stagecoach cards at a store where Hallmark Cards are sold. You see, the stagecoach is a most attractive card that comes folded flat in its own mailing envelope 
and can be set up to hold all the other cards your friends receive. The cab is a copy of an old English coach body, complete with passengers who look like they stepped out of a Dickens novel. The coach is pulled by four pair of prancing white horses decked in festive gold and white trappings. Once you see the Hallmark Christmas stagecoach, you'll know how decorative it will be on a mantel or window ledge or as a table centerpiece for holiday dining. What's more, there are two other Hallmark gift card styles to select from. The Hallmark Christmas sleigh, which is a replica of Santa's own, and the Hallmark Christmas train. Each of these costs just one dollar, including mailing envelope. And of course, each has that Hallmark and crown, the familiar symbol that means you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Frank, uh, I think those new combination card, gift, and decorations are a mighty fine new way to say Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's hard to believe Christmas is almost here. It's such a wonderful time, Frank. I, I kind of wish we could always have Christmas two weeks away to look forward to. I always like to watch the change that that comes over people this time of year. You can see it in folks' eyes and, and hear it as people hum some Christmas song, you know. And, it, and even in the crowded stores, it, people seem to have more consideration of their fellow shoppers. And, and the whole town seems to dress up for Christmas. <laughs> Windows and homes and streets all blossom out in holiday colors. And all that's drab and, and the unpleasant and the, and the worries of the world seem to take a temporary back seat. Yes, I, I wish Christmas were always two weeks away. And speaking of uh, weeks away, I'm really looking forward to next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Without this annual event, Christmas wouldn't seem like Christmas to me. Nor would it to most people, Mr. Barrymore. For next week, the Hallmark Hall of Fame is proud to join you in presenting A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens and to have you portray the immortal Scrooge for your 19th year. Well, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. A and remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday starring Miss Sarah Churchill, where next Sunday, Hallmark will again present the famous Amol and the Night Visitor. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Frug. Our script tonight was written by E. Jack Newman. Alfred Nobel was played by John Hoyt. Featured in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Charlotte Lawrence, Jeanette Nolan, Ben Wright, William Conrad, Polly Bear, and Herb Butterfield. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you until next week at the same time when we'll again present Mr. Lionel Barrymore's traditional appearance as Scrooge in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. And the following week, Mr. Edward Arnold will star in the role of Henry Byrd. And January 3rd, we'll tell you an exciting story about the famous cowboy Tom Mix on the Hallmark Hall of Fame.